Bonjour Paris. Uh, let's have another round of applause for the organizers, please. Thank you. Ça va? <laughs> okay, I've, I've, uh, my name is Noah, and I've just uh, used almost all of my French vocabulary right there. Well, that's not true. The rest I know is uh, Je voudrais un verre de vin rouge, s'il vous plaît. And uh, actually, Thibaut taught me one more, which I, I hope you'll use to describe my talk when people ask about it, which is uh, C'est pas mal. So, yeah. Uh, I've come here to give a talk about art to a bunch of European people, uh, which means I'll definitely be embarrassed at the end of it or I'll just be embarrassed immediately because my jokes don't land. Um, I've always loved coming to Paris. It's uh, not only the home to some of the most fantastic art in the world, uh, but also a city that has incubated a host of celebrated artists such as Claude Monet, Edgar Degas, Marie Cassatt, and that's just a short list of world famous artists from a single artistic tradition. And I could go on and on with the number of sculptors, architects, novelists, philosophers, and musicians who've lived and worked in this city. Um, in fact, just this week, I, I had the chance to visit the gravesite of one of my all-time favorite musicians, Jim Morrison, who uh, died in Paris when he was just 27, which coincidentally is how old I am. So anyway, uh, uh, being an undereducated American who is only capable of understanding the world through the lens of Hollywood cinema, uh, my first exposure to Parisian culture came not from any of those artists, but in the form of a movie. And that movie, of course, was Disney Pixar's Ratatouille. And it left a lasting impression on me. Ratatouille tells the tale of a rat named Remy who longs to be a Parisian chef, but is told all his life that rats can't be chefs. He gets around this loophole by hiding in a human line cook's hat and controlling his actions by pulling on his hair like a string puppet. Uh, my favorite character in this movie, however, is not Remy the Rat, but the jovial and heroic chef Auguste Gusteau, whose proclamation, anyone can cook, provides central inspiration to Remy. So, fellow humans and any rats that might be watching, today I continue in the grand tradition of this corpulent fictional chef by proclaiming that anyone can art. Full disclosure, however, uh, I've never taken a formal art class. I have never exhibited any art publicly. And as of a few months ago, I am not a professional software developer because I quit my job. Not to mention that I have no formal computer science background. So you might be asking yourself, what makes this guy qualified to give this talk? Well, it's actually quite simple. First of all, I can write computer programs in a variety of languages, including Elm, and in fact, I have been writing Elm and enjoying it for some time. Uh, second of all, I'm a human being, which uh, I believe is the only qualification necessary to make art. Uh, note I haven't said this qualifies me to talk about making art, uh, but for that, I will let you be the judge. So I'm gonna start by providing a brief background on the history of generative art, which I hope you'll find interesting. Uh, some of the first works of computer art were created by a German software engineer named George Nies. Uh, this piece here, uh, Sculpture One Plastic One, was made in 1965. Uh, and they didn't really have computer screens for, for making art back in 1965, so this was created using a mill, uh, which you might be familiar with as a kind of machine that uh, is still used today to cut paths on circuit boards uh, and works by programmatically carving patterns into some kind of surface. Nice used a random number generator to determine the height and width of the rectangles you can see here, and then used a mill to cut the shapes into an aluminum plate. Then he took screen prints of the results. To do this, he used a Siemens System 4004, a computer several times larger than my Brooklyn apartments. Uh, and you might think this is insignificant or not relevant to you until you realize that the very same computer was featured in the 1971 classic film Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, starring Gene Wilder. That's right, the very same computer was used by scientists to calculate the location of the last remaining golden ticket. So, clearly in the 1960s and 1970s, computer scientists had their priorities in order. Not like today. During the 60s and 70s, most generative art, after the use of the mill, uh, was made with pen plotters. Uh, these are machines into which you can feed a program and it will produce a drawing by mechanically moving a pen on a piece of paper. Uh, back in these days, these programs would have been written in the form of punch cards or punch tape. Artists like Vera Molnar, who herself uh, worked in Paris, were producing extremely compelling works of generative art using pen plotters as early as 1969. And this is a tradition that continues to this day. 
This is a picture of wall plotter art pieces that I took at the Recur Center in Brooklyn just a few weeks ago. Uh, the fact that still, people are still interested in creating works of art using pen plotters in 2019, 50 years after the work of art we just saw, uh, is proof that this is an enduring artistic medium. But nowadays, we don't need a pen plotter or a room-sized computer to get started with generative art. The barrier to entry is so much lower. All we need is a basic computer and some programming knowledge, and all kinds of languages and frameworks have emerged to help us make art. Even just within the JavaScript ecosystem, we have a plethora of options. There's Paper.js, which deals with vector graphics, Pixie.js, which is a 2G WebGL renderer, uh, Fabric.js, which uses an object model on top of Canvas, Easel.js, which seems to be the same thing as Fabric.js, 3JS, which is a lightweight uh, 3D library, Bonsai.js, I don't really know what that one is, uh, and P5.js, which is designed to make coding accessible and is inspired by the programming language processing, for those of you who have heard of it. Of course, each of these technologies has its own marketing site, documentation examples, and overall approach to rendering different kinds of graphics in different ways. There are so many options. How are we supposed to choose? Spoiler alert. Da, 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 da. We bring an elm. Oh, that's a long animation. Of all these preceding options, though, I found P5.js to be the most attractive due to its relationship with the tried and true programming language processing and its focus on simplicity. In fact, the book that I used to do the majority of research for this talk, uh, Generative Art by Matt Pearson, which I highly recommend, uses processing as its language of choice. Uh, anyone inspired by this talk to pursue generative art further, I highly recommend this book. It may not use Elm, but it's still going to help you. There is, of course, one big problem with both processing and P5. It's highly imperative. Okay, and it's also loosely typed, so there are two problems. Uh, in other words, it's not Elm. Seriously, though, the vast majority of calculations you need to do in order to make compelling generative art can be expressed by pure functions operating on immutable data. The Elm architecture conveniently separates the logic from the presentation, which turns out to be immensely useful in the way you think about generative art. Notice how in this example, which uh, is used to draw a spiral, by the way, if you can follow it, uh, a call to the line function is mixed in with the logic and the math. This mixing of logic and presentation makes the code harder to read, harder to organize, and harder to modify. For some, this is okay. Everyone has their different process and their different approach to making art, and I'm not here to poo-poo anyone's approach. Uh, but for me, the ability to iterate without going through, or sorry, to me, the ability to safely iterate and have a full understanding of what I'm changing, thanks to the Elm compiler, is so much more important than the ability to change whatever I want whenever I want. What's more, when you use Elm, it gives you access to a suite of fantastic libraries to handle the harder parts of making computer art. For example, uh, Ian McKenzie's ge geometry library is an absolute godsend. It allows you to easily create and transform 2D and 3D geometric shapes, and the accompanying SVG library can render those shapes directly from the exposed data text. This means you can think about all your shapes abstractly without having to memorize formulae. Honestly, I've learned more math per minute reading Ian's documentation than any math teacher has ever been able to teach me in a classroom setting. Elm also has solid mathematical foundations in its basics package and good facilities for generating randomness through the random package. Uh, this is not even to mention all the different rendering options we have through Elm, including SVG, kind of canvas, and WebGL. But for today, I'm going to focus on SVG. This brings us to the process I've been using to make generative art up to this point. My hope is that you can use this process, too, as a jumping off point to start making your own art. So here's how I do it. First, I find some visual phenomenon that fascinates me. So this could be something natural, like the way lightning forks through the sky, or the way a flame flickers. Uh, it could be a, someone else's work of art that inspires me, or it could be some mathematical thing like a fractal pattern. Then I try to reproduce whatever that thing is visually, in this case using the medium of SVG, and wherever possible I pull variables out into my model. Next, I introduce an element of variation over time. Uh, so that with each successive tick of my program, the image is going to change a little bit. This is like going from a static HTML rendering to an Elm program with a single message variance representing the passage of time. Finally, I introduce more variables, this time handing the consumer of the art some control over its functioning. And you'll see what this means in just a bit. 
I want to briefly call back to Emma's talk from earlier, because what they mentioned about starting with imagination and proceeding with implementation absolutely applies here. You need to start by picturing the thing you want to build before making it pretty interesting or fast. And uh, Elm is going to help you get there iteratively. To see this process in practice, we can look at an example. Uh, the first piece I worked on recently, uh, which in fact went on to inspire this talk, was called Fork Lightning. And the basic idea was to reproduce or approximate the way lightning forks in the sky using basic white lines. I began by modeling the, pro the problem visually, thinking about the different numeric values that would be associated with each line. Uh, each of the lines, which I came to call an arc, would need its own associated length and an angle value. In addition, each arc would contain a pointer to a list of new arcs, each with their own lengths and angles. So I was going to make a recursive data type here. Uh, each of these sub-arcs would have its start point at the end point of the preceding arc. An element of randomness would determine the length and angle of each arc, as well as how many new arcs to spawn. These values would not be completely random, but kept within a sort of parameterized range in order to make it look natural. Uh, one of the nice things about this approach was once I had determined this underlying data model, Sorry, I missed the sub arcs. Uh, once I determined this underlying data model, I could tweak the parameters of randomness until I achieved something that looked and feels the way I want. The only thing missing in this uh, configuration was an overall start point for the arc. So I wrapped the whole recursive data structure in what I call the bolts, uh, which contains the origin and lifetime of the arcs, as well as a seed of randomness generated when the bolt first spawns. Altogether, uh, these are the data types that I ended up with. You can see it's a, it's a very small model, but even this just right here is extremely expressive of the problem I'm trying to solve. And from this point, all that's really necessary is for me to pass in some in initial information and draw some lines. So this is uh, the function I used to draw those lines. You can see uh, I very easily translate the information from my bolt data type into a list of SVG elements. Uh, another option, which I used in future pieces but didn't know about at this point, would be to represent everything in the model in terms of the data types exposed by Elm Geometry, which I mentioned earlier, and then just use Elm Geometry SVG to render them directly. And that would save me a lot of code. The result was something that looked like this. And uh, this looked pretty good, but I wanted a way to easily play around with, this, with the different properties of the visual. Inspired by live coding demonstration I'd seen at Algoraves, I began to identify certain key variables that, when changed, would produce interesting differences in the visual. Then I thought, well, why not just expose those variables to the consumer of the art? So I made up a couple of funny words and uh, assigned each one to a slider, each slider corresponding to one or more variable in the program. And uh, you can play with this yourself right now at noazygordon.com slash forklightning. Uh, so if you want to pull that up, be my guest, but we'll look at it again later. And while you're distracted by that, it might be a good time to talk about performance. Uh, SVG is definitely not the most performant option for, for rendering complex drawings with a lot of moving pieces. There's definitely a limit to how many nodes you can be adding and removing uh, on every tick. Uh, in this case, because each arc is represented by a separate SVG line element, uh, a combination of high fremulation and high chaos quotients may cause your browser to crash due to the sheer number of elements being added and removed. Be forewarned. I could improve this by changing each bolt from a number of lines to a single polyline element, for example. So there are, there are ways to reduce this complexity. Uh, I could also improve it by using keyed nodes. And this is absolutely essential when making art with SVG and HTML. Uh, not only will the use of key nodes improve the performance of your artwork, but it will also prevent some awkward flick flickering that can happen in certain cases and make CSS animations more predictable. And CSS animations tend to be more smooth than uh, just updating values in Elm. Cool. Uh, so now I'm going to walk you through some of the other pieces of art I made using this approach. And you can follow along yourself at noahzgordon.com slash elm dash art. OK, so here's the fork lightning example that I was showing you earlier. And you can see uh, you know, if I increase the fremulation over here, it gets a lot more fremulated. Also, this is not a language barrier thing. I made up this word. Um, if I increase the chaos quotient, it gets a little bit more chaotic. If I increase the time dilation, it all slows down a little bit. Or if I decrease it, it speeds up. And uh, finally, the zoominess is going to zoom in and out of our uh, piece of art. So you can see that as I slide these uh, sliders back and forth, it creates very different effects and, in essence, different pieces of art. I consider this to be one piece of art in which control over what it looks like is handed out over to the user. So it's something in between art and a game, I guess. 
Um, you, so like what initially looked like fork lightning, uh, you know, if I toy around with this, now looks more like a, like radio static or something like that. Uh, another piece that I did after this is based on a Georgia O'Keeffe painting that I saw at the Chicago Institute of Art after Elm in the Spring. Um, so I believe this piece is called, uh, George O'Keeffe's piece is called Sky Over Clouds 4. Um, and this is just a sort of an approximation of that piece that is animated where the clouds slowly move toward you and uh, get bigger as time passes. And this one I like because it's very peaceful and uh, it, was, it was a nice change from the fork lightning. Over here I can adjust uh, the, what I called funkitude. So uh, you can see the clouds starting to come in now are a lot more funky. And then if I decrease that all, they just start to come in as rectangles, which is less funky. Uh, and then I can also increase the speed. So now our, our plane is moving much faster over the horizon. Cool. Uh, so this next piece is called Wave Clock Redux, which I, is based on a piece that I basically shamelessly stole from uh, that book that I mentioned earlier. Um, and there are a whole bunch of sliders here, but what I really want to emphasize here is that I see this piece more as uh, a brush that you might make, uh, or a stroke that you might make with a paintbrush, right? So as I control this, it's a little bit difficult because I can't see the things on the side. There we go. Uh, one second. Swoop. Okay, so like, let's say I want to start with like a really big radius but I want my, satur my lightness to be lower, so I want some really dark lines, and then I can decrease the delay again. Now I start making some dark lines. Okay, I'm happy with that, and maybe I just want, like, at the middle, something with a small radius and an actual hue, so I increase the saturation and increase the lightness, and then decrease the delay. Okay, now I'm getting some colors in there. So I'm sort of like toying with this as I go through until I arrive at something that I think looks cool. Or I could just let this spin on its own for a while and sort of let the computer have a field day. And uh, hopefully eventually it'll make something that looks cool. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, cool. So uh, moving on to the last thing. So this is a fractal pattern uh, known as a Sutcliffe pentagon. The idea here is that if you go to the middle of each side of a pentagon and trace a line out and then connect those lines, it makes another pentagon. So this is just going to keep on going in infinitely, forming more pentagons. Um, and then each pentagon is slowly going to get a color. So I thought this looked pretty cool, but at the end of the day, it's just pentagons. So I thought, you know, what if I uh, made it so that the, the growth of these little struts that are coming off is variable? So I'm going to make these struts a little bit smaller, and maybe the angle at which they come off is, is a little bit funkier. So I'm going to increase this offset. And what you'll see happening now is it makes this sort of like imperfect crystalline pattern, which I thought was a lot more interesting. So now it's, you know, just m much like in nature, things are based on these mathematical formulae, but you introduce little bits of imperfection over time, and it makes something that looks kind of interesting. Uh, made the shrug, the shrug growth too small, but you get the idea. Okay, so those are the pieces of art that I made uh, just in the past few months using Elm. Uh, I think they're pretty fun, but back to my presentation. Okay. Uh, before I wrap up, I just want to make a brief aside. Uh, as I said previously, I'm currently unemployed, uh, but I still believe that we have, as tech workers are in a position of privilege to change the world for the betterment of everyone who lives in it. Um, however, we can only do that if we organize and take action together, right? We're, we're not going to change anything just by doing things all on our own. Um, so I'm a member of this organization called the Tech Workers Coalition, which is dedicated to building worker power in tech. We have many chapters in major U.S. cities. Uh, there's even one in Bangalore. Uh, and if you're interested in getting involved or just talking more about labor organizing and ways we can change things and make them better, please tap me on the shoulder. You can find out more about uh, this organization, techworkerscoalition.org. Uh, that's all I have time for. My name's Noah, and I'm definitely not an evil demon from another plane of existence, although I've been told I resemble one at times. Uh, here's some things that I like. Here's my Twitter handle. I'm unemployed and will be tweeting about the stuff I make while I'm unemployed in my endless spare time. So give me a follow if you please. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Thanks you very much, Noah. Yeah, sure. So uh, who has questions? Okay.
um, or companies. So, yeah. So, did you try to recreate text paintings? Because I saw some of the paintings. Uh, I, I, I saw a Van Gogh museum exhibition here in Paris, and it's like really immersive art moving along. Did you try something along the lines of moving the, the brushes of paint like along the screen and, and generating, you know, like yeah. paint brushes? Yeah, so that's, that's, that was actually what I was considering to be like my next step for what I was going to do. So if you, if you think of like that, that wave clock thing that I showed, you can imagine if you could just like click on the screen and make a wave clock, like a small wave clock, and then sort of like toy with that and do it as you want. Think of that as a single brush stroke. And then, you know, whatever other you know, patterns or, or things that I come up with, essentially these become part of a toolbox, right? Different, different brushes that I can make strokes with in different hues and stuff like that. And making a, a composite uh, interactive painting like that is, uh, is really interesting to me. I haven't done that yet, but I, I would like to, so, yeah. No, I wanted to mention two things. Uh, so it's really a nice presentation. And one thing that you can do instead of having uh, comp controls on the computer screen is you can uh, talk to something like a Raspberry Pi and have actual knobs. Yeah. And that's sort of fun, especially if kids are involved. You know, the knobs should be big and they should have colors on them, stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, another thing that I used to do some stuff with processing, and I'm really inspired by what you and Emma have done because I'd like to, you know, translate that experience into, into Elm. And one thing that works out quite nicely is to uh, use semi-transparent colors, mm -hmm. and you get some really wild effects that you would not have predicted. So, but uh, anyway. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, yeah, to your first point, actually, uh, something that I was originally going to include in this presentation, but I didn't, I didn't get as far as I would like with it, is uh, I actually hooked up a MIDI controller to, to, my, uh, to my, my, and this is actually in the code, if I brought a MIDI controller up here, it would work, and I was turning the knobs on the MIDI controller and interpreting the sing signals to change the sliders. So that, that's another option, and, and I was actually talking to Liz about this, that maybe, maybe something that comes out of Elm Europe this year is an Elm MIDI library. I think that would be, uh, that would be really cool. One other thing, that have the mic, please. One other thing that I think would be great, I've asked a couple of people about this, and I think it does not exist. You know, so you make a really nice piece of art. Uh, it would be nice to be able to save a high-quality image mm -hmm. so that it could be printed. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe somebody here knows how to do that. I, I certainly don't. I mean, a screenshot is not adequate because you don't get a high-quality image that way. Yeah, th this is something that I know uh, processing can do. Right. I don't know if there's any sort of like Elm to PDF functionality. I think there are, there are like HTML to PDF things that could perhaps be ported. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would, that would be cool. Right. Another thing that processing does is that you can save, uh, if you have something that's animated, you can save a sequence of images uh -huh. and then make a movie out of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think these would all be uh, really, really cool to be able to do in Elm. Anybody else? We got one over here, if, if we still have time. Okay, so ha have you tried to use noises? Say that, say that again? Noise libraries. Oh, oh yeah, noise. So uh, that actually is on here. So there, there, you can see there's something called noise here. So this was just like me playing around with Perlin noise, actually. Perlin, Perlin noise is, is one algorithm that's pretty popular for generating noise in 3D effects. Yeah, by the way, it has also a new version, Simplex. Have you heard about yeah, that? So, yeah, I know about Simplex. I, I haven't had a chance to implement Simplex yet, but this is, uh, this is an implementation of Perlin noise in Elm that I, I hope to uh, open source once I can get a few other uh, noise functions together and once I, once I think it's worth it. I just didn't show this one because I, I thought it was kind of uh, clippy and, and didn't look as good. But uh, yeah, this, so, so noise is like randomness, but with more natural variation over time. And uh, this is one of the original, very popular noise functions. Uh, and you know that you can create a loops of noises. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, that that's definitely something that I would also look into open sourcing eventually to to like make the uh, art scene in Elm more robust because it's very useful. All right, I think that's. Uh, I don't see anyone else. Okay, cool. Well, if anyone else has uh, any questions or wants to talk about anything, come find me. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>